Okay, uh, good morning and welcome once again. Uh, hey, can I request uh, one of you all to please lead us in prayer? Anyone? Let's pray. Even Father, we are really thankful to you this wonderful day. For some, it's a morning, others, it is a night, and others, it is day. So, Lord, we are really thankful to you that allow us to meet on this platform so that we can learn your word we can learn on how to lead to do this work but now as we study this part we do pray that you will remind in us your revelation that will be revealed to the real want us to do and lord we also bring to you our teacher for you are the greatest teacher Therefore, we pray that you will also put in him the methods, the language, the unction of the Holy Spirit, that you will be able to do the work that you have assigned him for today. We praise you, Lord, that you are going to do this for the glory of your name and for our good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Charles. Uh, right, okay, so... Um... Let's continue with our course on worship ministry. Uh, in the last class, we uh, in chapter six, we looked at the technology part, uh, uh, the importance of technology um, in ministry and in worship ministry as a context. And um, and you know now that we know that the lectures are all recorded, and you know if you did have any confusions or didn't understand anything technical that was discussed last class i hope you i, I mean you can always go back and uh, you know look at the lectures online and and i'm more than happy and available to answer any of the questions that you can post it on the stream section and uh, i'll be happy to respond okay so that's what we discussed in the last class um today we move into chapter seven i want to club chapter seven and chapter eight uh, as one uh whole chapter right so uh, let's look at that chapter 7 now starts talking about uh, developing uh, a local community as a worshiping body right a local community you're developing a local community like a corporate setting a congregation how do we develop uh, what are the importance um, of a congregational worship right uh, so we'll look at a few pointers uh, and um, let's see where we go yeah, so um, a corporate worship, uh, is that important? Corporate worship, congregational worship, is that important? Yes. At coming together and... Uh, in fellowship and in, uh, in worship yeah okay so i have three people who agree with me <laughs> uh okay so uh, why is it important why is corporate worship uh important why is corporate congregational worship important If you are welcome to uh, unmute can and I, speak. Can I, can I say yeah. something? Um, because I look at it as from the angle of prayer. Um, I see the power of corporate prayer. Uh, you achieve you achieve more because you are spaced in different areas. But now when you are together in worship and you are doing it corporately, uh, there is a song which says that when the praises go high, the glory comes down. When you are many and you are doing it corporately, the glory of God comes down. Yeah. That's yeah. one of the points that I can bring up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks, Charles. Uh, totally agree with you on that, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Uh, anybody else? Why why is corporate worship important? Because it makes us feel good. 
warrants. I'm waiting. <laughs> Abni, what do you think? Right, there's power and agreement and unity in the Lord. Okay. Right, we minister to God first as His church, ch children service, uh, servants, uh, as a congregation. Right. Yeah. Yep. 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 Right, uh, I'm just reminded of this uh, beautiful Psalm. Right, Psalm 133. Uh, this talks about, uh, you know, it says how wonderful and how beautiful it is when we come together in unity, uh, right? And then it goes on to draw this beautiful imagery of uh, it looks like a dew from Mount Hermon, um, right? That's uh, and also oil dripping down Aaron's beard all the way down to his robes. Um, so there's some kind of an anointing thing that is released um, that you know from heaven, uh, just. You know, comes over us, and like Charles said, the glory of God just coming down, and the dew of heaven, and all of that is uh, is it, it just makes it more beautiful when we come together in unity, when we realize that we are gathered together in Jesus' name. That makes uh, all the difference, isn't it? Um, and you can think of a choir. Uh, not sure if any of you have been part of a choir, and you know, they're like say. You can have a 12 member choir to, or to 20 member to 50 member choir. And, uh, you know, there's one group, there's, there are the sopranos, there are the altos, the tenors, the basses, baritones, sometimes. Um, all of them are singing the same song. Uh, and, you know, one, say the sopranos are, are singing the melody and there are all these different harmonies and they all sound to make it sound like one, uh, isn't it? Um, and so there is unity in diversity. So there's, you know, the, there are parts that are diverse and, and every individual in a church uh, setting uh, are different, right? Every individual are different. And so when we come together, when we choose, when we set aside uh, our, you know, when we set aside um, that uh, all our differences and come together in unity and say, Lord, we choose to bless you and there's power. And in the earlier chapters, in the first chapter, actually, we saw uh, time and time again, they gathered together in unity. They lifted up their voice uh, in one voice, isn't it? So, uh, and so there is power to say the least in corporate worship, right? And, um, this is author called uh, Ralph Martin. He said that Christian church was born in a song, right? Um, and another important characteristic of a New Testament corporate song is the manifest presence of the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, once again, like as what um, Charles mentioned. So, and that's, and we see that very clearly, isn't it? In Ephesians chapter five, verse 17 to 19. Uh, we'll look at it in just a second, right? So, uh, and this is how we begin to develop a local community of a, a, a worshiping body uh, is by emphasizing and just simply teaching the importance of corporate worship and then you know and then let them see the fruit of it right um, but there are there are two uh, primary goals for corporate worship right the two primary goals you can maybe write it down uh, um, I'll add these to the notes next uh, year, but it's and it's very simple, right? Um, can someone read Psalm thirty-four, verse three, please? Psalm thirty-four, verse three. Psalm thirty-four, three says, "Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt His name together." Right? You see that? Okay. So there is no. Uh, explanation required there so oh magnify the lord with me it's like a typical worship leaders line there come guys let's let's just worship together right um magnify the lord with me and then the text kind of changes a little bit let us right let us corporate and and it leads to the next part let us 
exalt his name together. So the first primary goal of a corporate worship or a congregational worship is for us to come coming together to exalt him, to magnify him, to, to lift his name on high, to bless his name. Right? And so that's the first primary goal. And the other one is, can someone read a Second Chronicles 5, 13 to 14, please? Right, so the first goal of a corporate worship is for us to exalt God, and the second goal of a corp of corporate worship is to encounter God. Okay, so uh, when someone's ready, please read Second Chronicles chapter five, verse thirteen to fourteen. Second Chronicles chapter five. Verse 13 to 14, the Bible says, um, verse 13, okay. And it was the duty of the trumpeters and singers to make themselves heard in unison, in praise and in thanksgiving to the Lord. And when the song was raised with trumpets and cymbals and other musical instruments in praise to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love and the words forever and the house uh, uh, the house and the house of the lord was filled with a cloud so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the lord filled the house of god amen amen yeah thank you so yeah as you mentioned charles uh, and uh, in this text, we see that again, right? Uh, there are there are trumpeters, there are singers, there are uh, there are those who are playing the cymbals and uh, in different kinds of instruments, and uh, you know they were all declaring. So there are differences, and they are all coming together in unity. And when then uh, that happens, um, heaven is unleashed, right? Uh, heaven invades earth, um, isn't it? And so, and God encounters us in corporate worship. It's not that he encounters us only in our private times. He does that, right? And so we, in our personal worship, um, so we have to remember that one is not more important than the other. That is personal worship and corporate worship, right? They ha they go hand in hand. Both are important, right, on par. Uh, you can't say that, okay, only personal worship is important and ignore corporate worship completely. Uh, if anything, uh, there are two things that's happened during the COVID wave is uh, we've learned, we've either learned the importance of corporate worship or two is we've become very comfortable with being uh, with ourselves and watching services online. So one of these two has happened. Um, <laughs> yeah, am I right or wrong? <laughs> Maybe. Okay, so, uh, you know, we felt the need to connect with people to just have that, uh, you know, there was a time during the COVID wave, I think the first wave in 2020, uh, and then we, after we met like after six months or so, just the worship team. And uh, and then when we just shook hands or gave each other high five, we realized, my gosh, we, have, we haven't had that touch of, uh, you know, of our friends um, in so long. And that, that was so um, special, isn't it? And so, yeah, us coming together is something beautiful. And God encounters us the same way as he has encountered people, uh, you know, in... Uh, before, right? And um, one of the tragic histories uh, in the history of Israel is that uh, when their temple was destroyed by the Babylonians, right? It was a common place. Uh, it, it was a common place where the people of Israel met uh, in a sanctuary for corporate worship. And just like what we read, God would show up and encounter them. And that place was destroyed, and so people were devastated. And uh, and and you know, there's this, uh, and there's a song, very famous song that they sing uh, during their exile by the rivers of Babylon. Uh, you know, how can we sing? You know, we don't have this common place. Everything what we have has been destroyed and taken away. And so people were de devastated. So that is the most tragic uh, moment in the history of Israel. And saddest moment and also another the most joyous moment in the history of israel is when they came together to rebuild the temple 
a place where they could come together uh, corporately in worship. And if there's one thing that they understood is that the importance of corporate worship. Right? And uh, in heaven, uh, it's corporate worship all the way, isn't it? Every tongue, every tribe, uh, people from every nation. Um, yeah, good luck getting privacy up there. <laughs> Uh, right, so there is so much beauty in in us coming together as his children and celebrating our father. Uh, there's something so beautiful about it, so genuine and so authentic, uh, that it unleashes heaven on earth. Um, right, and and suddenly I begin to see why Jesus starts off the prayer by saying "Our Father," right? and all of us come and say that and. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It does something when we come together in unity, right? Um, and so, uh, if you look at the notes, the, one of the first things what we ha what happens in congregational worship is that we minister to God, right? Um, we read in uh, First Peter chapter two and also in in Re Revelation chapter one that we are now royal priesthood, right? We are priesthood okay one of the primary responsibilities of the priests in the old testament in the tabernacle of da uh, in the tabernacle of david moses and in the temple of solomon was that uh the the primary duty was to minister unto the lord Right, by making sure that there was bread on the table of showbread, by making sure that the golden lampstand was always burning and the altar of incense uh, was always, you know, uh, there was always incense being poured out in the altar of incense, uh, making sure that the sacrifices and every other, in all that they did, they were ministering unto the Lord. And so now that we in the new covenant, um, as his priests, our primary responsibility is to minister to God. Okay, um, so as a congregation, we minister to the Lord, not with the ulterior motive of receiving a blessing, but rather with the motive of blessing Him, whether He blesses us or not. Right? Uh, can I hear an amen? <laughs> uh, right? Whether He blesses us or not, we choose to bless him. Amen. Um, so that's the first point there. In congregational worship, we minister to God. Uh, in corporate worship brings about a sense of unity within the church. Right? Uh, think about uh, all the different uh, cultural backgrounds, um, ethnicities, uh, tastes, languages. Um, but the one thing that we have in common is that we have we are saved by God's grace, right? And so we love Him. Um, just this class, for example, um, isn't it? We are from, we are not only from different backgrounds, uh, you know, we are also different individuals. We are 19 different individuals um, on this call. Um, and most of us, I mean, all of us are in, from different geographical uh, locations, isn't it? Um, and that says something about it, uh, right? Uh, you you guys know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, you know, when you meet a new person, say for ex uh, and say, you know, they introduce their name, and uh, the immediate follow-up question is, uh, where are you from? Yes, yeah, has, has that happened to anyone? Uh, isn't it, hey, uh, you know, especially say Bible college, when we have in-person classes, we have students coming in, um, you know, um, every year, I mean, they introduce themselves as like, hey, I'm so and so. I am from so and so. I am from this land. Right? Uh, and then, as soon as that individual uh, says that the person is from a, a certain land, a geographical area, we try to think immediately uh, what's popular in that area. Right? Uh, for example, say one person is from Hyderabad. <laughs> we can't help but say it's like you know oh i love hyderabadi biryani isn't it uh, and so this there's there's so much of richness and diverseness uh you know uh in every individual the way we come from uh what our background is but when we come together in unity we are gathered together in the name of jesus that makes it all that makes all the difference 
isn't it? Um, and suddenly, you know, he is excited. God is excited to come and be among his children. Uh, and there's so much of unity, um, you know, that takes place. And 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 when unity happens, uh, there's uh, there's nothing more powerful than uh, than unity, in my opinion. It, Charles, I see your hands raised. All right. Thank you. Um, I was I'm talking about the unity of prayer, rather of worship. I was doing ministry in the northern country of of South Sudan, it's north of Uganda, and we were doing a youth ministry there, training them, and we praised in Arabic, and we were from Uganda. We didn't know Arabic, but. Uh, they, as they praised, we, we, we were moved by the songs and then we joined in because we were hearing how they were praising and it had the, the same tune with the, the Ugandan one and we also joined, we were humming and man, <laughs> things became yeah. very nice and everybody got involved and we were unified because of the worship and everyone was like wow thank you lord for doing this so there is that unity when you are worshiping right. and you are diverse from different cultures thank you yeah 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 thank you thanks for sharing that Charles. yeah yeah i mean i've been in a couple of uh settings where where they uh they've been worshiping in their regional languages uh and, and that you're just and you're just being there even if you don't understand the language uh, you know they are worshiping god and you just say that amen to what they're saying it does something different isn't it um so yeah thanks for sharing that um okay and the third point in the notes that's mentioned is uh the songs we sing as a congregation enable us to learn teach and reinforce spiritual truth Right. Learn, teach, and reinforce uh, spiritual truth. Uh, Ephesians 5.19 says, Speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts. Speak to one another. Uh, Colossians 3.16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. So in Ephesians, talking about sing to one another uh, and then in Colossians 3 16 is talking about teaching and admonishing uh, one another in Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs so uh, there is a, there is equipping that is happening as you're singing songs as you're singing songs to one another there is teaching that is being imparted um, in corporate setting and uh, if you remember one of the videos that we saw uh, earlier on during the course um, is how um, uh, this the the worship in the synagogue happens isn't it so one person is, uh, is singing uh, the psalm and everybody else is repeating the tune and you know after the main uh, the lead was uh, the worship leader isn't it uh, it's it reminds us sometimes when we just say let's take the song for um, ten thousand reasons for example um so we're coming together uh, as a church as a congregation and we start singing you know you are rich in love and you are slow to anger your name is great and your heart is kind for all your goodness we will keep on singing for ten thousand reasons and forevermore um you know you can uh we can we're all good at memorizing we can just memorize it and just blurt it out like it has no meaning and then when we begin to engage with those words right when we become begin to become one with those words saying you are rich in love i'm thinking about all the times uh you know that he's uh just showered his love on me like how his love sustained me how his love got me back how his love is keeping me alive uh, how his love forgives me, right? He's so he's rich in love. He is slow to anger. Um, this just reminds me of his mercy and how he is slow, uh, you know, slow to anger, and he does not treat me like my sins deserve, as the psalmist says, right? Your name is great and your heart is kind. Um, so all of this thing is being reinforced. You're reminding yourself. It, yeah, are you guys with me? Uh, that's just one of the example. One song as an example that you can take any number of songs um, and declare. So, 
Um, if you remember Acts chapter 16, uh, where Paul and Silas were in prison, when they started to praise him, uh, praise God, it was not just their cell that was broken. It was not just Paul and Silas who were set free. It was every other prisoners uh, were also set free. Right? And so coming together uh, in unity as a corporate, uh, you'll never know who's, uh, who is being set free by your praise could be the person next to you to your right or to the left who's never encountered God but they just hear you praising him saying you're rich in love and they're like convicted as like, what is what is this who is this God that they're this person is singing about and um, and they are set free yeah um, so all of that is happening and uh, corporate worship prepares our hearts and provides the atmosphere for the preaching of the word Right? It prepares our hearts. Corporate worship prepares our hearts uh, and provides the atmosphere for the preaching of the word. Hosea 10, 11, um, the latter part uh, of that verse says, Judah shall plow. Right? It's uh, such a beautiful poetic language that you know, Judah shall plow simply means praise. Right? Judah means praise and shall plow. And plowing is what? It's a farmer's language right? where a farmer is plowing the field and preparing the, the land uh, for the rains to come and for it to bear fruit, isn't it? So praising God prepares our hearts to receive a word from God. Okay, praising Him, worshipping Him prepares our hearts to receive a word from God, right? Um, do you remember Second Chronicles chapter 20 about the King Jehoshaphat, right? Uh, it's a story where the land of Judah, Israel, being is being attacked by all these nations, three nations uh, from all around. And um, alarmed Jehoshaphat, he calls on for a fast for the entire nation. People from every town and city came, right? And they fasted and they prayed, and they were reminded each other. Jehoshaphat, in the front, in the middle of the assembly, he says, "Are you not the Lord God who brought us out of Egypt, our fathers from Egypt? Are you not the one who did this? Are you not the one who did that? Are you not this? You know, are you not the God who sustained us in the wilderness?" So, he's proclaiming, declaring about God's faithfulness. What it leads to is that then a prophet comes forward and says, "Thus says the Lord." That this battle belongs to him. You will not fight. You will only have to take up your position and see the deliverance that God provides. Isn't it? So what's happening there is praise is preparing our hearts uh, to receive a word uh, from God. Right? And that happens uh, corporately. Yeah, are you guys with me? And yeah, okay. So um, and finally, it facilitates us to express the feelings of our heart in un uninhabited uh, worship. Uh, you know, um, Psalm 100, uh, Psalm 95, uh, come and shout for joy. It's all an expression of praise, isn't it? A shout for joy, all the earth. Uh, Psalm 95 says, come and bow down uh, to the King of Kings and it's, um, and worship him. Um, so it's facilitates us to express the feelings of our heart in uninhabited worship. It could be whichever, you know. Um, uh, it could be painting or dancing, singing, clapping of hands and whatnot. So all of these beautiful things are happening in a congregational um, worship, right? And so uh, let's move on to the uh, next uh, section. Um, so how to develop a local congregation in uh, spontaneous worship? How do we develop a local congregation in spontaneous worship or just worship for that matter? Right. Um, so in order to bring about any change in a group of people, especially in the body of Christ, people need to receive a revelation. Right. A uh, revelation, revealing and unveiling. Right. That's that's what revelation is. So another word for revelation is unveiling. Right. Uh, so if a person is wearing a mask or uh, if you take the Middle Eastern culture where, you know, they would uh, cover their faces with a shawl. Uh, women uh, mostly and you know what you would say can you unveil yourself and in that unveiling there's a revelation and so in our language in our context that could be teaching isn't it and so a teaching brings about revelation 
right when you when you hear something that you had that you did not hear before or know before and you would say oh wow okay I, I didn't know that before right that's a revelation isn't it and so the first step in creating a culture or developing a culture guys uh you know let me say that um in your ministry or in your place wherever you are as a leader if you don't set a culture culture will be set for you by the people that you are leading it could be good or bad culture okay i mean if it's good we will look at how it makes you know how we can make it better but if it's bad like you know, you don't, you, you don't want to have a culture of uh, gossip or culture of complaining, culture of whining, culture of, uh, you know, uh, everything negative that you can think of, right? So um, as a leader, you are immediately thinking how, what kind of culture do I want to set, right? A kingdom culture or an earthly culture, and then you press towards it, right? And the first step is teaching. And I, I, I say this before, as there is no such thing as too much communication, especially when you're communicating with your team. There is no such thing as over communication. You keep emphasizing, you keep communicating, right? Um, if you come to APC, um, there are a couple of announcements we make every Sunday. Like every Sunday, we 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 play uh, the vision and the mission of APC. We are the salt and light in the city of Bangalore and the nation and of India and the nations. Right? Why do we do that? We are, we are emphasizing again and again who we are. What is our mission? What is the vision? Right? Uh, and there's so many things that we do on a regular basis, uh, repeatedly. So uh, there is no such thing as over communication. So teach, teach, teach. Right? If it's if you want to set a, a culture of worship, teach about worship, uh, and that brings about a revelation, right? Um, Isaiah six verse one to eight. We all know that pro, uh, famous uh, passage of scripture. Uh, worship begins with the revelation of worship, right? So Isaiah sees the, uh, the seraphim uh, worshiping, and then that brings about uh, you know that it leads him to you know go on his knees, uh, you know, in, into a posture of worship. And that revelation eventually leads to conviction, right? So the revelation of worship will bring about conviction, uh, which is something you you believe strongly uh, in. That is, okay, I am convicted now. I am moved. And so revelation leads to conviction. And, and because you are convicted, you will respond to an altar call, isn't it? And that is the action. Right? you are responding right um so and there's a uh god asks a question okay who will go for me whom shall i send and then isaiah is convicted and says here i am lord send me okay and that eventually releases you to the destiny that god has prepared okay and so all of this is just setting a culture of worship so you're teaching your people um, and and that teaching leads to conviction and action and that then that releases them into their destiny the people in your congregation uh, to the destiny that God has prepared for them right um, you guys with me any questions any thoughts we are with you pastor and I had about the corporate the importance of corporate worship about King Jehoshaphat, I had posted it in the, in the, in the chat. So right. I agree with you and I know that the Lord is always with us when we are working corporately. Yes, yeah. uh, there is power in unity. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Right, um, so we'll move on. Um, and like I said, I just wanted to merge chapter seven and chapter eight as one, as a continuation from you know, one to another, right? Um, and one of the huge differences, uh, you know, uh, I don't know about other countries in detail, but uh, look at India. 
India is just vast. Uh, it confuses a lot of people with our diversity. <laughs> uh, right? It, it's just uh, the cultures are so rich. It's so different. Um, <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's not even funny, the differences. I mean, you go to North Bangalore, uh, they sound, they talk in different Kannada. You come to, uh, you know, come to South Bangalore, the way their Kannada sounds different. And then that's just one city. And then you have an entire state of Karnataka. With people from North Karnataka sound so different from people from South Karnataka or Mangalore. And that is, this is applicable to every state uh, in India, every city. Uh, you know, there are languages and the languages, there are dialects. Um, and so there's, it's just vast and rich. And I'm pretty kind of sure it's, uh, it's kind of similar to uh, the nations in Africa or, um and other countries that i don't know of right but uh when it comes to india right the con uh, uh and i i've just seen this and i'm sorry if i'm just using india as an example because that's what i've seen right so one of the greatest challenges of uh, indian christian church is its uh western heritage Right, um, most mainline denominations follow a westernized liturgy and music in their worship because of the heritage. Right, so when uh, when missionaries came to India, they translated the Bible and their own hymns into the local languages for use in worship. Uh, but now, even a century later, churches still use um, same hymn and uh, uh, you know the translated book, which is very common for prayer. Uh, for worship right uh, and and a lot of translations of that uh, main hymnal liturgy did not happen or could not happen uh, because again um, you we are, we are talking about translating um, say an English liturgy into uh, all the different languages uh, in India that I don't even know how many unofficial languages are there in India. Um, so I can, you know, and Bible happens to be the the highly the most uh, translated book in the world, right? And then when it came to see liturgies and prayers and songs, uh, there seems to be a challenge, right? Um, and so we, at APC, we've just managed to translate two songs of from English to Hindi. And I have to tell you that it was quite a challenge. <laughs> okay, because uh, when you're translating a song, um, you're not you, you're not going to translate it literally. Now, if we translated Shout for Joy, I, I think we translated Shout for Joy and Better Than Life. <laughs> if we try translating it word for word, literally from English to Hindi, it would sound so funny in Hindi. And so um, we have to think uh, from a songwriter's perspective. You have to think like a musician. Um, OK, you know, what words are going to match? What word makes sense, right? And so uh, because of the linguistic limitations, uh, missionaries were not able to make a translation that fits well to the common use of the language, right? And so problems like mentioned in syllables or structures make it almost impossible for people to understand uh, texts of many songs. So these are all the challenges, guys. What I'm talking about is what we've inherited, right? Uh, the Christian, uh, Indian Christian church, uh, because we've uh, inherited a Western heritage. And our challenge has been the language uh, for, the, for the most part, right? And so I just want to emphasize the importance um, of us, our churches, uh, worshiping him in our regional languages, in our regional indigenous languages. Uh, it's very, very crucial. It's very important, right? And, and so some of the practical tips um, that we can incorporate uh, for our congregational worship is that uh, the church could have an additional service um, in that particular language, if possible. Um, if this is not possible, the songs could be bilingual. Uh, the local language translation of the same song can be sung in addition to the English, right? Um, so this is this was one of our main motives or intentions to translate uh, 
you know some of our english songs to uh hindi and uh and we recently wrote uh, a tamil song uh, that will be releasing so we 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 wrote the song in tamil and then we translated it to hindi so the hindi song will be releasing this month and the tamil song will be releasing um next month and so i um, we just took a short change in our direction because we wanted to uh uh we wanted to be able to reach out to the people um, of our land of our nation uh, so that we can worship with our regional languages uh, as well right so that is in addition if you can if your church can um, afford to have uh, an an additional service in its own language that's awesome um, not all songs have translation in the local languages so singing a few songs fully in the local language alone serves the purpose of opening up and drawing people to the lord in worship okay and um, the singers must learn to pronounce the words correctly and in the right way i'm in that process of learning to pronounce some hindi words correctly because hindi has been my arch nemesis for <laughs> uh for uh a long long time so um me and hindi didn't get along i me and hindi don't get along still so uh, some of the bible college students uh in person they know that and uh and it, it irritates my wife when i try to speak in hindi because i kind of butcher it <laughs> so you know when i want to irritate her i know what to do uh but yeah i mean just being able to pronounce the words correctly and all of that uh, it goes a long way right um, and, and it also it would help if the worship leader knows the language and can transition into exhorting the congregation or praising and declaring the attributes of the lord in that language so going back and forth i mean if you're leading if, if it's a combined service or a bilingual service where you're leading worship uh, you're singing songs in english and your regional indigenous languages uh, having a worship leader who can switch between uh, the languages uh, is a luxury. Uh, yeah, that, that goes a long way. Guys. So, and these are just some of the pointers, uh, you know, and the importance just to re-emphasize the importance of having indigenous uh, uh, expression of worship uh, in our churches. Okay. Um, right. Any thoughts? Any uh, anything else that you want to ask or add? And I'm pretty sure, you know, uh, I mean, we have a message of the gospel, isn't it? Uh, so if there is a message, uh, uh, you know, there is a messenger who's coming with the message. And then there is the other person who is waiting to receive the message. And, uh, you know, if the messenger is not communicating in the language that is spoken by, you know, the person who's receiving the message, then the whole point of the message is lost, isn't it? And um, and so, good news. We have news, and that is good. Uh, and we need to, you know, take it to the people, uh, you know, who understands, you know, it, who will understand it in their own language, instead of them having to expect them to understand uh, what we have to say. Yeah. Um, so that goes a long way, and that again. Uh, it's just building the kingdom of God here on earth. All right, so you, you're with me? Yes, okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, awesome. Great. Um, so that kind of concludes, uh, you know, uh, a course content uh, for this course on worship ministry. Um, well, uh, I mean, I hope you've been uh, able to grasp and learn uh, something, um, you know, in this journey. Uh, I've I've had I've had fun teaching you all uh, the course content. Um, yeah, I mean, all the best. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. So, uh, anything about ministry or whatever. Okay, what we what I'd like to do is uh, we'll take this break and then we'll come back and there's a video that I want uh, to play 
um, it's 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 a good teaching on leadership, and I thought it would be good for all of us to just uh, to listen to it. Okay, so we'll take a break, and we'll uh, we'll be back in ten minutes. All right, cool. Thanks, guys. See you.